Right. So this is the agenda for this session. So first, uh, I will explain what brownfield integration means, and then I will give an introduction to WS2 Enterprise Integrator. And later on, I will be discussing how we can do brownfield integration with uh, WS2 Enterprise Integrator product. So these uh, pictures were taken from some online resources. So on the left, we have a brownfield land, and on the right, we have a greenfield land. So uh, this uh, brownfield term has different meanings in different countries. So in general, a brownfield land means a, a land which is previously used or a land which previously built upon. Uh, in urban planning, a brownfield is a term used to denote a land which is uh, used for commercial and industrial purposes. Uh, the greenfield land means uh, which is never used for such industrial or commercial purposes. So similarly in software, a brownfield system is a system which is already exist. So brownfield integration means integrating with these already existing systems with the rest of the world. So let's see why this brownfield integration is so important. So uh, most of the modern systems are capable of integrating with other systems through APIs. But if you take an organization, it's hard to expect all the systems available in an organization to be like that. So there are legacy systems uh, which, cannot, which doesn't provide such integration capabilities. So those systems will get replaced uh, over time. But to do the digital transformation, nobody wants to wait until, to, until that to happen, right? So, and also, uh, implementing new, uh, these systems from scratch may, be, uh, may not be cost effective. So that's why we need to drive all these existing systems towards the brownfield integration. Okay, so we have identified several types of uh, systems in, uh, in the brownfield. Some of the systems uh, expose some kind of a standard way to do integrations. Uh, standard in, uh, way means support for standard protocols. So integration with those systems are straightforward. Most of the integration solutions provide support for those kind of integrations. Next, we have systems based on non-standard or proprietary protocols. So these systems provide integration ext extension points, but those are not based on the standard. So comparatively, uh, integration with these systems are not that straightforward, but it's not impossible. And if we think about uh, most of the legacy systems, legacy systems uh, uses files as a transferring medium to do integrations. So integration with those systems has to happen using files. So that's the third type. Then the last type we identified is the system which does not provide any kind of integration points. Um, but there are, there are ways we can still integrate. Some of the stateful systems use databases to store data. So in that case, we might uh, get a chance to integrate with these uh, directly with these databases. So that's one option. So those are the types of systems we have in Brownfield. So now let's look at what are the key functional requirements to have in an integration solution to do Brownfield integration. So I have listed down five uh, uh, such uh, requ functional requirements, transformation, routing, orchestration, protocol switching, and parallel processing. So let's look at each of them in coming slides. So here uh, on the right, we have the existing system in the brown field. So we, we are building a new system. So we get a message in some message format. We, we can't send the message as it is to the existing service. We need to do some kind of a transformation to make it compatible with the existing system. So that is meant by the transformation. Next, we have routing. So here in the brown field, we have two different systems. Uh, here we have system A and system B. So based on something on the message, we might need to route 
route the message to uh, one of these systems. So here we get two types of messages. So based on something on the message, we route it to system A and the other message to system B. So this is routing. And when we are building new systems out, out of existing system, we might need to combine multiple uh, existing systems together. So that is what meant by service orchestration. So here in the brown field, we have three different systems, system A, B, and C. So we are going to orchestrate these three systems. So we, when we receive a message, we first invoke the first service and get the result. Using the result of that, we invoke the, the next uh, system and get the result. And then finally, with that, we invoke the system C. And finally, we deliver in the response back to the client. So here, this is kind of a service chaining uh, scenario. So orchestration can happen based on some other patterns too. So this is a very simple uh, orchestration scenario. Okay, next we have protocol switching. So here in the brown field, we have an existing system which uh, provide integration through JMS protocol, but we need to expose it over HTTP protocol. So let's see, we receive a message over HTTP and the integration solution should be capable of doing the protocol switching and delivering over the JMS protocol. So finally, we have parallel processing. So for some uh, reasons, we might need to uh, spawn messages in the integration solution and uh, call these existing systems parallelly, mainly to reduce the latency. So here we get a message. At the integration solution, we clone messages and invoke the exiting system at the same time. So this, this is parallel processing. So now let's look at WC2 Enterprise Integrator product. Before last year, what we had in our integration platform was set of different servers. So we had enterprise service bus as the central hub, which does all kind of integration. And also we had message broker as the message uh, messaging middleware. And also we had a data services server, which, which is used to data integration related and stuff. Likewise, we had set of uh, servers. So we, we, one thing we found is that uh, when we are building a large integration uh, project, we often combine multiple of these servers together. So to make things easier, we did a change. We repackage all these into a single product called Enterprise Integrator. Okay, so here's the, uh, here's the structure of Enterprise Integrator. So as you can see, uh, the Enterprise Integrator has uh, several key uh, areas, service integration, basically the ESB part, and data integration, so that uh, data integration means the data, data services capabilities and business processes for uh, long running uh, stateful integration. So likewise, there are several key areas. So by combining all these key areas, uh, we can build any kind of integration solution. Okay, so one thing we need to understand is that this enterprise integrator is not a new product, rather it's a repackaging of existing set of uh, products. So if we open up, if you boot up the enterprise integrator runtime, what you, you will get is a, not a single VM with all these capabilities, rather it, will, it has set of individual runtimes. So one common pattern we notice uh, when implementing integration scenarios is when we want to do data integration, we usually combine data integration features with ESB features. So while doing this repackaging, we combine both ESB and DSS features together and we offered a single runtime. We also have dedicated runtimes for business process server, message broker, and for EI analytics. And we introduce a new runtime called micro ESB in the latest 6.3.0 release. So that's we are going to discuss uh, more detail. If you uh, think about the service integration capabilities, so this is basically the ESB capability. 
Uh, WC2 ESB is a lightweight, high-performing enterprise service bus, which is based on Apache Synas project. It has a wide variety of uh, features, uh, and it supports uh, most of the industry standards. So, and also, it is highly extensible. Since it is highly extensible, we, uh, it makes it uh, easier to integrate with any systems with any kind of system. So, and also, the one noticeable fact is that it covers almost all the enterprise integration patterns. So next, we have data integration. So on the data integration, uh, we can expose any kind of data source as a service to the outside. So basically, it can, the data source can be a relational database or, or a non-relational database. Not only databases, it can even expose a Google spreadsheet or Excel sheet as a as service to the outside. So that is data integration capabilities. So in ESB, uh, what we are doing is uh, uh, we are doing stateless integration, stateless integration. But we have the capability to do stateful and long-running integrations as well. So that is done using this business processes runtime. The business process runtime supports BPL, BPMN, and human task features. Okay, so now let me uh, talk a little bit more about the micro ESB uh, profile, which we introduced recently. Uh, if you uh, think about the microservices architecture, mainly there are two types of services, the atomic services and the composite services. So the atomic services are the most fine-grained services, which serves a particular uh, task. Uh, the composite services are services which, uh, which are created using uh, combining multiple atomic services. If you think about the ESP features, it is capable of uh, composing these composite services. It has, it has all these uh, functionalities required to uh, wire and uh, come up with composite services. But one, one major uh, point that prevent it from deploying into the microservices architecture is the startup time. So in micro ESB, we drastically reduce the startup time. And also, we reduce the distribution size of this particular profile too. But still, we kept all the key mediation and data integration features in this profile too. Of course, we had to remove some of the stuff which are not related to uh, microservices architecture, like uh, uh, multi-tenancy, uh, hot deployment. So those stuff are removed. Uh, but all the key mediation and data integration functionalities are already available. Here is a comparison of uh, micro ESB and the conventional ESB profile. So as you can see, the startup time is drastically reduced from 40 seconds to 5 seconds. And the distribution size also reduced. And you can see the all key mediation and data uh, integration features are present in both these profiles. And we have removed some of the stuff like building clustering, uh, deployment synchronization, and multi-tenancy. Okay, so still the tooling support and the car deployment, all those stuff are uh, supported in both these profiles. Okay, so now let's see how we can do brownfield integration with uh, enterprise integrator. So now let's see how we can uh, implement uh, the key functionality requirements which we talked about uh, in uh, doing brownfield integration. The first, the transformation. So this is the same diagram I showed you before. So the only difference here is we have placed enterprise integrator as the integration solution. Okay. So uh, enterprise integrator is capable of transforming any message format into any other message format. So basically, it supports almost all the well-known message formats like JSON, plain XML, uh, CSV. So built-in support for all the well-known uh, message format is there. But if we want, we can introduce a new message format by simply extending the functionality. The unit of message processing uh, in enterprise integrator is called a mediator. So if we want to do something to a message, like transformation routing, we can use a mediator. 
So to do transformation, we have set of mediators. So to visually data map from an input message into the output message, we have a mediator called data mapper. And if you want to uh, alter a particular segment of a message, only a small part, we can use the enrich mediator to the enrich message. And also, if we want to create an entire new payload structure uh, and, have, and make some parameterized value into that, we can use the payload factor mediator. And if we, are, if we have to do some kind of a advanced transformations, we can write an XSLT script and plug it into the ESP runtime using the XSLT mediator. So those are the mediators available to do the transformation. Okay, so this is how we can do visual data mapping using the data mapper mediator. On the left, you can see uh, you can see the uh, input message, and on the right, there's the output message. From input to output, uh, we can wire the different fields. So we can, uh, while doing the wiring, we can apply some operations to operations like concat to uppercase to lowercase, we can apply them while doing the wiring. So this is how we can do visual data mapping using the data mapper mediator. Okay, so next we have routing. So the routing can be based on something on the content of the message or it can be the, on the headers of the message, maybe uh, some property of the message. So, and also it may be some property of the environment as well. To do the routing, we have two mediators, the switch mediator and the filter mediator. The switch mediator is pretty much uh, similar to the uh, switch case programming construct we have in languages. And the filter mediator is uh, pretty much same as the if-else construct we have in languages. By using those two mediators, we can route the messages uh, to different systems. Next, service orchestration. To do the service orchestration, we have a mediator called call mediator. So simply using the call mediator, we can sequentially uh, invoke multiple systems. So these uh, invocations are synchronous. But the underlying engine uses asynchronous and non-blocking transport implementation. Since this is asynchronous and non-blocking, uh, the underlying trading mechanism doesn't wait for the response to arrive. So since, because it is non-blocking, we can do more work with less resources. So that's the uh, service orchestration functionality we have in the integrator product. So next, uh, the protocol switching capability. Uh, ESB or the enterprise integrator has a layered architecture. So the re message receiving part and the message delivering part is fully decoupled. Because it is fully decoupled, we can simply receive over any protocol and deliver it over any protocol because there's no coupling. So, so that's about the protocol switching capability. So now let's see how we can do brownfield integration with different kind of systems we talked about. First, uh, the integration with systems that talk in standard protocols. To do integration with standard protocols, system that talks in standard protocols, the enterprise integrator has the ability to support wide variety of protocols. We have HTTP, HTTPS, and JMS, AMQP, Kafka, MQTT, those protocols for messaging, and FTP, SFTP for uh, file transferring. So likewise, almost all the key uh, protocols are supported in this product. Okay, so here's how we can do uh, uh, the brownfield integration with uh, the system that talks in standard protocols. Here on the right, we have the existing system which uh, talks in FTP protocol. So now we want to expose it over an HTTP API. So we bring in enterprise integrator into the middle and we simply connect it with this existing system over FTP protocol. And then we expose a new API over HTTP protocol. It's pretty simple. Okay, so now let's see how we can do 
the integration with systems that talks in non-standard protocols. For most of the well-known uh, proprietary protocols, we have the built-in support. For example, we can consider about the SAP system. So we have a SAP adapter to integrate with SAP systems. But if there are some system which we, which we don't have the support for, which we don't have the built-in support, we can uh, implement some custom functionality and plug it into the runtime. So here's how we do it. So we have the existing system on the existing system on the right, which uh, talks in non-standard protocols. We bring in enterprise integrator into the middle, but still we can't integrate with the existing system. So we write a connector and plug it into the enterprise integrator runtime. That connector is capable of connecting with the existing system. Now, similar to the previous case, we can simply expose an HTTP API. Okay. So now let's see how we can extend the functionality of uh, enterprise integrator. So as I said, this uh, enterprise integrator or the ESB has a layered architecture. So the extension points are present, uh, present in each of these layers. So it's just a matter of writing some, using the extension point, it's a matter of writing some Java code and deploy it into the, uh, the runtime. So these are the complete set of extension points we have in the enterprise integrator. I'm not going to discuss uh, each of them, I'm just focusing on the connectors. Okay, so connector is kind of an add-on for the uh, ESB runtime. So basically we can use a connector to uh, integrate with any kind of cloud-based systems or any uh, on-premise systems. So uh, we have already uh, developed uh, over 150 connectors and made available in the WC2 connector store so that you can go and download them and install into the runtime. So if something is not available, we can write our own connector. So it's, so either we can use SDKs provided by some of the systems, or maybe we can use web APIs. Okay. So next we have integration with files-based systems. So, the, so most of the legacy systems still use files as a transferring mechanism for doing integrations. So e Enterprise Integrator has uh, support for a wide variety of those such file transferring protocols. So, uh, so here, so let's uh, talk about some of the use cases. So here, uh, the existing legacy systems push some data uh, to the file systems as files. So the Enterprise Integrator listen for that particular uh, file system and if something is available, it pick it up and invoke a web API over HTTP protocol. So this is uh, listening for file system and picking the files and delivering over some other protocol. And next uh, use case is exposing an HTTP API for an already existing system based on files. So here, uh, the existing system again store files as the, uh, to the file system, and the enterprise integrator expose an API for those file systems. So here, once we get a re invocation request from the client, it go and check for the file system, and if something is available, then it pick it up and deliver the result back to the client. So to pick, files on demand, we have something called the file connector. Okay, so finally we have integration with uh, systems that uses databases. So as I said, some of the existing systems pro doesn't provide any kinds of integration points. So one possibility of doing integration with these systems is to integrate directly to their databases. So to do these kind of integrations, Enterprise Integrator has data integration capabilities, so which basically, uh, which, which can be used to expose any kind of data source as a service to the outside. So here, that's what we are doing. So in the brown field, we have an existing system which will store data into databases, and the Enterprise Integrator connect to those databases and expose new services to the outside. 
So that's all what I plan to discuss. So we discuss uh, about what is brownfield integration means and uh, I give an introduction to WS2 Enterprise Integrator product and then how we can do brownfield integration using the product. <laughs>